This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to an adventure fantasy novel. The Desolate Era. Book 35, The Ionian Race. Chapter 11, Autarka's Blood. Ji Ning felt as though he was an ant who was facing the vast, starry night sky. Ning instantly turned pale, finding it hard to breathe as that aura of power swept outwards. It was simply terrifying. The aura of that glob of blood, it vastly surpassed the auras of any of the hegemons Ning had met thus far. Although hegemons had incredible auras, they couldn't even compare to the blood-red sun that was glowing before him. At Ning's current level of power, he was strong enough to smile and jest in the presence of hegemons. But when faced with this pool of red blood, he felt utter terror from every fiber of his very being. What is that? Nine dust came charging over. He had been planning to take Ning away and flee, but he was instantly dazed when he saw that large pool of blood-red liquid, roughly 30,000 meters in size. Dark North, my young friend, it is useless for you to take away that Omnigeddon blood fruit tree. The sea dragon leader began to laugh. The reason why that tree was so marvelous was all due to this drop of blood. Ning and Nine Dust stood next to each other. They could leave this world whenever they wished, and so they were in no haste to flee just yet. I uprooted the blood fruit tree. Don't you care? Ning asked. Why should we care? The sea dragon leader laughed, long ago, this world didn't even have the blood fruit tree in it. For you to uproot it does nothing to us at all. If this world originally didn't have a blood fruit tree in it, where did it come from? The nearby Nine Dust asked, and, did you just say that this giant pool of liquid is a drop of blood? Yes, a drop of blood. This is a drop of blood which Autark Bolin created after pouring tremendous amounts of work and essence into it, and it is filled with boundless mysteries, the sea dragon leader said. An Autarka's blood? Ning and Nine Dust were enlightened. This wasn't just a random drop of blood from Autark Bolin, it was something which Autark Bolin had spent tremendous effort in refining. No wonder it was so terrifying. Long, long ago, Autark Bolin left behind this drop of blood. We have been here on the Autarka's orders, and we are to prevent all cultivators from reaching it. Dao lords, emperors, everyone must pass the trials before gaining access to this drop of blood, the sea dragon leader said. Later on, the Ionians discovered this place and came here. They realized that the Autarka's blood was simply too powerful. Thus, they came up with a way to graft the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree, a tree with tremendously strong vital energy, on top of it. The tree naturally rooted itself around the Autarka's blood, and over the course of many years it began to slowly evolve and transform before it finally managed to draw some of the essence from the blood. After absorbing some of the Autarka's blood, it began to grow larger and larger while giving birth to more and more fruit. Now, it has finally reached a size of 3 million kilometers and can give birth to a crop of 36 fruit at a time, the sea dragon leader said. Every single fruit is far more special than ordinary Omnigeddon blood fruit, because they were grown from an Autarka's blood. This tree has spent more than 30 million chaos cycles absorbing the blood and has already transformed. It shall always produce 36 fruits with each harvest. However, now that you have uprooted it, it no longer has access to the Autarkva's blood and so the fruit it produces shall most likely be nothing more than ordinary Omnigeddon blood fruits. That makes the value of this tree much lower than before. Ning's face tightened. True. Ordinary Omnigeddon blood fruit trees produced three fruits per harvest, while this one produced 36. This made it comparable to 12 ordinary blood fruit trees. However, the fruit only possessed miraculous properties due to having absorbed blood from the autark. That was the reason why the tree could be described as having a hundred times the value of an ordinary tree. Just ten or so times. Ning knew that he couldn't be too greedy, but he still felt rather disappointed. This sort of treasure was not nearly enough to ask an autark to help out. The sea dragon leader suddenly said, the autark said that if one day, someone arrives who is capable of taking away this drop of blood, our two races shall regain our freedom. Dark North, my young friend, you can try for yourself whether or not you can take the Autarka's blood away. Yes, if you can take it away, we shall regain our freedom. 
The flaming equine leader grew excited as well, as did the hundreds of beasts within the world. Life here was simply too boring. Many of them had been born here, but the oldest ones had been sent here by Autark Bolin himself. They knew just how lively the outside world was, whereas this place was incredibly dull and lonely. Take it away. Ning and Nine Dust were intrigued. It was created by the Autark, who poured all of his effort into its creation. It is incomparably precious, far more than a hundred times more valuable than the tree you just uprooted. Most likely, even other Autarks would very much desire to acquire this drop of blood and learn some of Autark Bolan's secrets from it. The Sea Dragon leader continued to describe how valuable this drop of blood was, causing Ning to feel even more eager. Dark North, give it a shot. Nine Dust looked at Ning and sent mentally, you'd definitely be able to revive your Dao companion if you acquire this drop of special Autarka's blood. I'll give it a shot. Ning didn't hesitate at all, immediately flying into that enormous crevice. As he moved closer to it, he saw that the round pool of blood was beginning to swivel and emanate auras of increasing power. Ning had to clamp down upon his fear. Although he couldn't prevent himself from feeling terrified, he didn't feel any sense of danger at all. This meant that this blood drop wouldn't cause any harm to him. Autark Bolin had left it behind for future generations of cultivators to benefit from, not die from. Whoosh! Ning exerted his will, causing a divine power clone to appear next to the pool. The clone reached out with its right hand to touch the giant pool of blood. Ning wanted to be careful, this way, he would at most lose a bit of his divine power rather than his own life. Eh. The drop of blood was incredibly cold, but it didn't cause Ning's clone any harm at all. Arise. The divine power clone tested out applying a bit of power to it. Rumble, the drop of blood immediately began to shake and shudder. Silken lines began to appear all across this entire vast planet, with all of the lines converging upon the drop of blood. Ning's divine clone was completely unable to move it at all. Arise. Seeing this, Ning moved his true body over to the pool. He manifested three heads and six arms, then reached out with all six arms while using his hegemon armor to cover and protect his hands as they delved into the pool of blood. Ning pulled, hard. Boom! It was like an ant trying to shake a tree, the countless lines across the world connecting to this blood drop fought against him. If Ning wanted to move this blood drop, he would have to be able to overcome the might of this entire planet. Lift it up. Move it away. The two clan leaders and the hundreds of beasts all watched eagerly. The day this drop of blood was taken would be the day they completed their responsibility to test the cultivators who came to this place. Only then would they be able to leave. Arise. 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 Ning did his utmost, but there was no way he could overcome the full power of this entire planet. This was an estate world which had been created by an autark, after all, it was incredibly stable and not something which the likes of him could shake. Inside the Ionian Kingdom. There was a beautiful, ancient palace here which served as the central temple for the entire kingdom. A handsome youth was seated atop the royal throne within the temple, dressed in elegant black robes. His aura was awe-inspiring and remote. He was the true supreme leader of the Ionian race. Emperor Anshan. He had been protecting this place since time out of mind, because this temple was connected to the five most important ancestral grounds of the Ionian race. Every single one of the five was extremely important, but of course, the most important was the first ancestral ground. This was because it had been left behind by Autark Bolan himself. Rumble, suddenly, a tremor swept through the palace. Emperor Anshan was connected to all five ancestral grounds as their protector, he naturally noticed it and immediately turned pale. The first ancestral ground. It's shaking. This was a world which had been created by Autark Bolan, and the Ionians knew it well, the only thing which could cause that entire world to shake was if someone was acting against the Autarka's blood, the most important treasure of all. Emperor Eilhide, Emperor Dug, there may be invaders within the first ancestral ground. Come right away. Emperor Anshan sent frantically. Just a few seconds later, swoosh. Swoosh. 
two figures simultaneously appeared. One was the handsome, red-haired Emperor Eilhide, the other was the tall, skinny, and pale-faced Emperor Doug. The two had been shocked by what they had just heard and had immediately hastened over. These three were the three most powerful emperors of the Ionian race here in the endless territories. There are invaders in the first ancestral ground. Emperor Eilhide and Emperor Doug were both anxious and filled with murderous intent. Yes, go in right away, Emperor Anshan shouted. Let's go. Let's go. The bodies of the three emperors began to blaze with flames. These flames were generated by the igniting of the Ionian blood. To open the link to the first ancestral ground was extremely difficult, an enormous price would have to first be paid. However, now that something strange was going on inside they could no longer afford to worry about it. The Desolate Era Chapter 12, Devastating Rage The three most powerful emperors of the Ionian race were all covered in blazing flames which began to reach out and connect to each other, slowly forming a strange diagram of a giant claw-shaped hand. This looked like the technique which Autark Bolan had left behind in that beast world. Rumble. The flames from the ignited Ionian blood instantly reached out to cover all three emperors. Swoosh. They were teleported straight into the estate world. Let's move as fast as we can. The three emperors stared at the void around them, then turned to look at the astral river. They knew that they had already arrived, and Emperor Anshan shouted anxiously, if we're late, things will be even more difficult. Let's go. Whoosh. Emperor Anshan generated a dimensional wave and led the other two emperors with him as he instantly vanished. This world was extremely stable, not even hegemons would be able to forcibly tear through space-time, much less them. However, mere dimensional teleportation was much simpler, as it was merely an evasion art which rode dimensional waves across fairly short distances. There we are. After the third dimensional wave, they appeared in the skies above that enormous, strange planet within the astral river. No. Emperor Eilhide's face instantly turned pale, and his scarlet eyes instantly turned blood red. The tree. Our Omnigeddon blood fruit tree has vanished. Emperor Anshan and Emperor Dug stared as well. They saw that off in the distance, there were ripples of energy spreading outwards and pushing aside the surrounding mist. The three of them were able to see that nothing more than a giant crater was left ere the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree had been, and within the crater was a giant figure which was holding on to the Autarka's blood and seeking to take it away. Not only did he take away our Omnigeddon blood fruit tree, he also wants to take away the Autarka's blood. Emperor Anshan was so enraged that he ground his teeth to the point of shattering. That's Dao Lord Dark North and the Nine Dust Sect Lord. Emperor Eilhide immediately recognized that Ji Ning was the one holding on to the Autarka's blood, while the figure next to the crater was that of Nine Dust. Emperor Eilhide had met the two of them after the Wave Shift Realm adventure, and he had even purchased some fruit from Ning. Now, however, they had become mortal enemies. These two are nothing more than Dao Lords, yet they dare to try and steal one of the foundations of our Ionian race? Emperor Anshan only grew even angrier. Kill. Kill them both, Emperor Doug growled as well. Kill. Emperor Eilhide felt just as murderous as the others. They held these two Dao lords in no regard at all. They were the three most powerful emperors of the Ionian race. They normally viewed Dao lords as young children, they were so powerful that eating Dao lords was of very little help to them. Weaker emperors like Malobo, however, did like to eat the Dao Lords of the Dao Alliance, as did the other Dao Lords of the Ionian race. This was why the Dao Alliance and the Ionians were mortal enemies. Ning had transformed to become utterly titanic, and his six arms had reached out to grab the drop of Autarka's blood as he sought to seize it. With each attempt, he saw those countless connecting lines appear throughout this entire world. These threads? Ning stared at them carefully. He wanted to try and discern just how this drop of Autarka's blood was connected to the rest of the world and how he could separate them. If he could come up with a way to sever the connection, it would be much easier for him to take away that drop of Autarka's blood. Ning had spent over 10 million years breaking through those 80,000 plus formations. 
he had already grown accustomed to analyzing and dissecting his problems. The Eonians. Nine Dust let out a startled cry from the skies above Ning. Ning was startled upon hearing this. He turned his head, only to see three figures charging through the skies towards him with looks of absolute murder on their faces. Ning immediately recognized one of the three as Emperor Isle Hyde, who had negotiated with him previously. Although he had never met the other two before, he had learned of them long ago and knew them to be extremely powerful emperors of the Ionian race named Emperor Anshan and Emperor Dug. Emperor Isle Hyde, Emperor Anshan, and Emperor Dug. These three were all comparable to the eight archons of the sacred cities. But of course, much like first-tier Dao lords there were differences in power within this general stratum and amongst these three Ionian emperors. Different weapons, different secret arts, different ultimate attacks, in short, there were many things that could cause a difference in power. Thanks to their Ionian bloodlines, all three of these Ionian emperors were extremely strong. The youthful-looking black-robed Emperor Anshan was the strongest of the three, the most powerful member of the Ionian race. Supposedly, his techniques were incredibly frightening and he had access to a universe treasure. He probably wasn't much weaker than a hegemon in might. Clan leaders, Nine Dust sent anxiously, you said that any cultivators who come here must pass your trials. The three emperors of the Ionian race should also have to pass the trials, right? Of course. The sea dragon leader nodded. Agreed. The flaming equine leader nodded its massive head as well. The sea dragon leader flew into the skies, coiling around itself in midair as it let out a deep, rumbling bellow, halt, emperors. If you do not halt, you shall be attacked by both of our races at the same time. The flaming equine stood there on the ground, its entire body blazing with flames as it let out a furious, awesome roar. Halt. There were nearly 200 beasts in this area, and they roared out this word in unison with unstoppable majesty. Swish. 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 The three emperors who had been diving downwards through the skies came to a screeching halt, ugly looks on their faces. He's uprooted our Omnigeddon blood fruit tree, and now he wants to take away the Autarka's blood. Emperor Anshan stood there in the skies, staring angrily at the distant sea dragon leader as he bellowed, we Ionians are definitely going to kill these two thieves. Dao Lord Dark North, Nine Dust Sect Lord, the two of you really are quite bold. How dare you steal treasures from the ancestral grounds of the Ionian race? Ancestral grounds? Ning flew over to Nine Dust, and the two stared back at the three emperors. With the two races of beasts standing guard over them, they didn't panic. Our two clans are here on the Autarka's orders to protect this place. Anyone who wishes to benefit from the Autarka's blood must first pass our trials. Our young friend Dark North has done so, which means that we are in compliance with the Autarka's orders. Even if he wishes to take the blood away, there's nothing wrong with that, the sea dragon leader said. But you three? If you also pass the trials, we won't interfere if you want to kill these two, but if you cannot, we have no choice but to protect our young friends. Be but, Emperor Eilhide spluttered furiously. Just pass the trials. Easy, right? Come one at a time and defeat both of our races, that's all you have to do, the sea dragon leader said. Emperor Anshan and the others had ugly looks on their faces. Defeat the two races in succession? Every single one of the flaming equines and sea dragons had reached the Archon level, with the clan leaders being even stronger. Only a true hegemon would have a chance at surviving an assault from so many of these creatures. Emperor Anshan had already given it a try long ago, but he wasn't even close to being able to succeed. But we are the Ionians. This is our territory. Emperor Anshan said furiously. No, this is the Autarka's territory. The only thing we know and care about is the Autarka's command, the sea dragon leader said. Be be but, but that Omnigeddon blood fruit tree belongs to our Ionian race. Emperor Anshan said. Ha ha ha. You were all too weak and unable to make much use of the Autarka's blood, which was why you planted that Omnigeddon blood fruit tree here all those years ago. Over the course of countless eons, you have harvested countless fruits from this tree, 
and the value of those fruits vastly exceeded the value of the original tree itself. The sea dragon leader continued, you've earned enough. Since our young friend Dark North has passed our trials, he gets to decide what to do with the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree, not you. But it's ours. It belongs to the Eonians. Emperor Eilhide was growing anxious as well. The Omnigeddon blood fruit tree had undergone a thorough transformation. Even if it lost access to the Autarka's blood, it was still comparable in value to 12 ordinary trees. It truly was a marvelous treasure. Most importantly of all, when it was able to absorb essence from the Autarka's blood, the unique fruits it gave birth to were more than 10 times more valuable than normal ones, making the tree close in value to Crimson Wave Temple. The Ionians absolutely viewed it as important as life itself. Once they lost this tree, they'd have to wait millions of chaos cycles before any new tree they planted over the blood would have absorbed enough essence to transform. But, in roughly a million chaos cycles, the Inyong Samsara wheels would destroy the endless territories. There was no way they could rear a second tree. This marvelous tree was literally one of a kind. They had already started to accumulate fruits long ago, as once the Inyong Samsara wheels destroyed everything this entire world would probably be devoured and destroyed as well. They would no longer have access to any more fruits. In the final million chaos cycles, they were planning to absorb as much of the essence from the Autarka's blood as they could, and they were even planning to shatter the tree apart and drain the essence the tree had taken in from the Achuarka's blood. The Desolate Era Chapter 13, Mortal Enemies The essence of the Autarka's blood would greatly benefit the Ionian bloodlines of the Ionian race. To normal cultivators, this tree which Ji Ning had just taken away was nothing more than a tree that would allow for larger than normal harvests of fruit. To the Ionians, however, the Autarka's blood essence within it was worth more than 10 million chaos cycles worth of fruit. It was something they absolutely could not afford to lose. No point talking too much. Our young friend Dark North has passed the trials, which means we shall protect him. If you want to act against him, you can simply attempt the trials as well, the Sea Dragon leader said coldly. If you want to fight, let's start. Otherwise, hurry up and beat it, the flaming equine leader roared as well. Emperor Anshan and the others were enraged, but there was nothing they could do. Ning and Ninedust both let out sighs of relief when they saw this. It seems there's nothing they can do to us, Ninedust said with a laugh. Once we leave, they'll probably do everything they can to hunt us down, Ning said. The endless territories are vast, while the Ionians are mortal enemies of the Dao Alliance. These three emperors wouldn't dare to act too rashly. Ninedust was quite relaxed. Ning nodded. Once they left this place, they would be like wild geese disappearing into the skies. Given that the two of them had access to the Vitalis art, they could easily mimic the true soul auras of others. They could literally go anywhere they pleased, there was no need for them to fear these three emperors at all. Suddenly. Good, good, good. An utterly enraged laugh rang out, echoing in the heavens. Ning and Ninedust both raised their heads, surprised, to stare at the three leading emperors of the Ionian race. The leader of the three, Emperor Anshan, was so enraged he was laughing. He let out a furious growl, if that's the case, estate spirit, come out immediately. Whoosh! A ripple of power manifested, causing the light in the skies to coalesce into the form of a white-haired woman with an extraordinary aura. An enigmatic smile on her face, she asked, what is it? The spirit of the estate? Ning and Ninedust were both shocked. Suddenly, they remembered that. When they had been in the beast world with the Autarka's Dao, that world held an estate spirit within it. It wasn't unreasonable for this world to have an estate spirit of its own as well. Spirit of the estate, this was a world for us created by our ancestor. These are our ancestral lands. But these two outsider Dao lords have not only stolen away our Omnigeddon blood fruit tree, they even seek to steal the Autarka's blood. Please intervene and slay these two interloper Dao lords, estate spirit. Emperor Anshan said loudly. Ancestor? Ning was surprised. Emperor Anshan, did you just say, ancestor? 
Was this place created by Autark Bolan? Nine Dust called out loudly with surprise. The distant Emperor Anshan glanced downwards, a hint of a cold smile on his lips. The members of the mighty Ionian race are the descendants of Autark Bolan. Ning and Nine Dust were both rather stunned. The descendants of Autark Bolan? Were the Ionians really this incredible? Any member of the Ionian race who has been awakened shall possess the bloodlines of our almighty ancestor, Autark Bolan. Emperor Anshan said proudly, the Ionian bloodline is special, because it is the bloodline of an Autark. This is a world which Autark Bolan created for us, it is our ancestral lands. The Autarka's blood was left behind for us by the Autark as well. Ning and Nindust were both stunned. It made sense. The Ionians did possess an incredible bloodline, supposedly, after becoming eternal emperors they could use their bloodline to slowly improve in power even further. It must be understood that for most emperors, improving in power was incredibly difficult. Spirit of the estate, you can go ahead and slay these two interlopers. Emperor Anshan looked anxiously at the estate spirit. The white-haired woman let out a cold snort. I am unable to intervene. Unable to intervene? How can you be unable to intervene? Emperor Anshan was starting to grow frantic. He knew just how powerful the estate spirit was, within this estate world, the estate spirit was virtually invincible. Even hegemons would probably be weaker than it in power. I must inform you that this world was not, in fact, created for you Ionians, the white-haired woman said. During the dawn war against the Sith, Autark Bolan was worried about our side being defeated and so he left behind many backup plans to help the cultivators rise to power again in the future. He created this estate world for that purpose, and those 300 plus hegemons willingly passed down their legacies as well. This was all for the sake of the countless cultivators who would be born in the future. It wasn't just for you Ionians. Emperor Anshan was stunned. Afterwards, we won the war. Autark Bolan's life grew peaceful once more, but he eventually grew lonely and so developed the Ionian bloodline, creating your Ionian race. The Autark left behind a single undiluted drop of the original Ionian blood in this place, hoping that some of the many descendants of the Ionian race would be able to grow powerful enough to absorb it. Alas, this branch here in the Flame Dragon realm verse is far too weak. Despite the passage of countless years, none of you have been able to absorb this blood. The estate spirit chuckled. Emperor Anshan, Emperor Isle Hyde, and Emperor Dug all felt rather ashamed. Are you saying this isn't the Autarka's blood? The distant sea dragon leader asked, puzzled. It is the Autarka's blood, but it was formed after countless unique processes were applied to it. This blood was part of the original blood which gave birth to the Ionian bloodlines and race, which was why I referred to it as the original Ionian blood, the white-haired woman said. If any of the Ionians were able to reach hegemony, he would more or less be able to absorb this drop of Ionian blood. Once he did so, he would finally and truly be qualified to refer to himself as a true child of Autark Bolan, and he would be far stronger than ordinary hegemons in power. Unfortunately, this lot here is completely useless. The white-haired woman shook her head, then turned to look at the still-stunned Ning and Nine Dust. As for you two? You came into my estate world using the Autarka's medallion, the white-haired woman said. This naturally counts as being here with the Autarka's commission. I won't act against you too. However, the Autarka's blood was the font for the entire Ionian race. Ordinary cultivators like yourselves cannot absorb it, no matter how hard you try. Also, Dow Lord Dark North, there's no need for you to waste your efforts trying to move it. I am in control of this estate world, and I absolutely will not permit anyone to take it away. If someone wishes to take it away, the only method permissible is absorption, but only Ionians can accomplish it. Hegemon level Ionians, at that. The white haired woman glanced sideways at Emperor Anshan. You were given every advantage in the world, but you made nothing of it. The exalted Ionians actually ended up having such useless progeny, what a pity. Humph. As she spoke, she began to vanish. Wait. This realm verse is about to be destroyed soon. Emperor Anshan called out frantically, 
when that happens there will be no way for this estate world to exist by itself. Relax. An estate world which was laboriously created by Autark Bolin will not be so easily destroyed, the white-haired woman said. However, when the Inyang Samsara wheels destroy this area, this estate world shall vanish from it. The ties of destiny which link us together shall have come to an end, and I will go search for a different branch. Humph. Autark Bolin left behind many branches throughout the vast chaos verse, and many of those branches were given no chance to absorb any of the Autarka's blood. I gave you more than 30 million chaos cycles, but you weren't able to make the best of this opportunity. Don't blame anyone but yourself. Emperor Anchen and the others began to grow frantic. Become a hegemon? Easier said than done. There had been quite a few supreme Dao lords in the history of the Ionian race in this realm verse, but their chances of succeeding in the Dao merge were absolutely minuscule. Thus far, not a single one of them had ever succeeded in the Dao merge and becoming a hegemon. As for existing emperors who were at the Archon level to reach the hegemon level? That was even harder. The Ionians knew a great many things, but they had only heard of a single hegemon known as the Paragon of Pills who had started off as an ordinary eternal emperor but then managed to train all the way up to the hegemon level. Ha, huh, the beast world we visited previously ended up flying away as well. It seems as though this estate world is also capable of independent movement, nine dust sent mentally. The Autarka's blood truly is terrifying, though, apparently, only Ionian hegemons are capable of absorbing it. How powerful would they become upon doing so? So this is what an Autark is capable of. Ning stared at the swirling globe of blood inside the massive crater. Its aura dwarfed that of any hegemon, how strong would one become after absorbing it? Alas, Autark Bolin had left it behind for the Ionians alone. So what should we do next? Nine dust sent mentally. What can we do? Since we cannot earn the Autarka's blood, we might as well leave, Ning sent mentally. Right at this moment, Emperor Anchen's voice rang down from the skies above, Dao Lord Dark North, Nine Dust Sect Lord, all you need to do is leave behind the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree and swear a lifeblood oath not to divulge any of those 300 plus hegemonic legacies to outsiders. If you are willing to do this, then the three of us would also be willing to swear oaths to never attack or pursue you through any means at all. The hegemonic legacies? Ha, huh, I'm a member of the ancients. For the sake of all these legacies, the ancients would definitely do everything in their power to protect me. Do you really think I'm afraid of you Eonians? Nine Dust snickered. Ning raised his head to stare into the skies as well. If he eventually failed in his Dao merge, these hegemonic legacies were the most important thing he could leave behind for the three realms in the future. Dark North, are you going to reject our offer as well? Emperor Anshin growled. These 300 plus hegemonic legacies were left behind for all cultivators, not just you Eonians. By what right do you demand an oath from us? Ning replied coldly. Not even the hegemons themselves had demanded Ning swear a lifeblood oath, what made the Eonians think they had that right? Damn them. They are courting death. The nearby Emperor Dug and Emperor Eilhide were infuriated as well. Emperor Anshin said furiously, this is your final warning. Hand over the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree and swear the lifeblood oath. Otherwise, we Eonians will use everything at our disposal to hunt down and kill you too. We won't stop until you are dead. Whoosh. Ning vanished into thin air. As for Nine Dust, he lifted the Autarka's medallion up and activated the power within it. A ripple of might surrounded him, and a heartbeat later, he vanished without a trace, having left this estate world. The Desolate Era Chapter 14, Secluded Cultivation Emperor Anshin, Emperor Dug, and Emperor Eilhide were all stunned. They had just issued a dire threat to pursue Dark North and Nine Dust until they were dead, but they had left without even saying a word in response. This attitude indicated that they truly felt no fear towards the Ionians at all. Estate spirit, how could they have just left like that? Did you let them out? Emperor Anshin turned to glare furiously at the distant white-haired woman. 
When Eonians wished to leave this estate world, the estate spirit had to teleport them through space-time out of it. The white-haired woman said calmly, I already stated that they came in via the Autarka's medallion. They left using the same method. It had nothing to do with me at all. Besides, even if I did send them away I would at most be able to send them to another world within the domain of the Ionian kingdom. However, they used the Autarka's medallion to flee far, far away. The Autarka's medallion? Emperor Anshan and the others felt both enraged and helpless. They had never heard of this medallion before, but the estate spirit's words were beyond question. They couldn't help but sigh to themselves. Oh, Autark, since you made this world, you should have just left it to us, your children. Why did you have to leave behind a medallion for outsiders to use? In truth, however, Autark Bolin had first created the medallions, and only then had created the Ionian race. Please send us out, Emperor Anshan said. Very well. The white-haired woman nodded. You still have over one million chaos cycles left. Your branch still has a chance at absorbing the Autarka's blood. When this realm verse is destroyed, it'll be time for me to leave. We understand, Emperor Anshan said, although in his heart he was unwilling to accept this. Whoosh. The white-haired woman waved her arm, causing a dimensional ripple to spread out and cover all three emperors. They were teleported through space-time. To the planet outside of this estate world. The three emperors reappeared within the ancient temple. Eh. Emperor Anshan closed his eyes, sending out an invisible ripple of power which completely merged into every part of the Ionian kingdom. The Ionian kingdom just informed me, Emperor Anshan said as he opened his eyes, that no living beings have entered it via the first ancestral ground. It seems as though the estate spirit was right, Dark North and Nine Dust have already teleported away to an extremely distant place thanks to their Autarka's medallion. Damn. I've never heard of this medallion. They're able to enter and exit our first ancestral ground by using it? The other two emperors didn't want to accept this either. The Inyong Samsara wheels are going to destroy the Flame Dragon Realmverse soon. To successfully absorb the Autarka's blood in the next million or so chaos cycles, our chances are quite low, Emperor Anshan said. We've harvested many fruits over the years, but we've used up many of them to help rear all of those Dao Lords. We absolutely have to acquire the large amount of Autarka's blood essence which was distilled into the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree. Agreed. The other two emperors nodded as well. The Autarka's blood was the wellspring for the Ionian bloodline, and the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree had drawn upon the essence of that blood for over 30 million chaos cycles. This had caused the tree to undergo a fundamental transformation. When they fully absorbed all of the essence within it, it would be of tremendous benefit to them. This mattered to the Ionians more than anything else. Doug, Emperor Anshan commanded, immediately mobilize all the forces we have available to find as much information as we can regarding Dao Lord Dark North and the Nine Dust Sect Lord. Once we find any trace of them, move to kill them and take that tree back. Agreed. Emperor Doug said seriously, I'll oversee this matter personally. I'll hide, Emperor Anshan instructed, you've made quite a few friends amongst the emperors of the various races. Come up with a way to convince them to help us track down Dark North. Very well. Emperor I'll hide nodded. Although the Ionians and the Dao Alliance were mortal enemies, the Ionians were still the weakest of the six powers. The Brightshore Kingdom, the Aberrants, and the Ancient Cultivators each had a hegemon, while the Dark Kingdom consisted of many cultivators from another realm verse who had all gathered together, allowing them to survive despite being ostracized by all five of the other organizations. This was a testament to how deep the Dark Kingdom's foundation was. Weinzage, Dalord Skyshatter, Dalord Owlblack, they all belonged to the Dark Kingdom. The number of elite Dao Lords they had was another testament to their power. As for the Dao Alliance? That went without saying. 99% of the endless territories was under their control, and they had countless Dao Lords and many publicly acknowledged emperors, with even more being in seclusion. The Dao Alliance didn't care about the other powers at all. The Ionians were different. At the top end, they had no hegemonic cultivators. In terms of raw numbers, 
they had very few people. It was all thanks to the Ionian kingdom that they hadn't been wiped out. But of course, if a particularly incredible figure arose within their ranks who succeeded in the Dao merge and became a hegemon, that person could absorb the Autarka's blood and vault the entire Ionian race to become the preeminent power in the Flame Dragon realm verse. Alas, the Ionians had never been able to produce a hegemon. As a result, the Ionians were the weakest of the six major powers, and the enmity between them and the Dao alliance was deep and unabiding. As a result, the high-level Ionians did their best to try and befriend high-level members of the Dao Alliance, trading them treasures and so forth. This was one of the reasons why the Dao Alliance hadn't declared an all-out war against the Ionian race. In fact, the high-level members of the Dao Alliance held a certain belief, they viewed the existence of the Ionians as a good way to help temper the countless Dao lords under their rule. Emperor Eilhide was the primary point of contact for making friends with the emperors of the other races and organizations. Legacies from over 300 hegemons, and the essence of the Omnigeddon blood fruit tree. Both things are supremely important to our Ionian race. Emperor Anshan's eyes flashed with sharp light. From this day forth, Dark North and Nine Dust shall be the greatest enemies of the Ionian race. We have to find them. We won't let them escape. Emperor Doug said. Sooner or later, they'll fall into our hands. Emperor Eilhide narrowed his eyes as well. Whoosh. Nine Dust appeared out of nowhere within an empty patch of space which was incredibly far away from the Ionian kingdom. He then waved his hand, allowing Ning to appear next to him. Crack. The medallion in Nine Dust's hand began to break apart. The power's been used up. Nine Dust shook his head helplessly. A pity. Even if we weren't able to use it to re-enter the Ionian Kingdom, it still would have been an excellent escape mechanism. It's gone now though. Yes, it is indeed an incredible treasure for escape. Not even a host of hegemons would be able to stop it, Ning said. And it really does allow one to teleport quite a long distance through spacetime. If Ning had to rely on his own powers to traverse spacetime, it would probably take him half a year to travel such a great distance. Dark North, what are you planning to do next? Nine Dust asked. We've really won quite a few things for ourselves, Ning said with a laugh. Those 300 plus hegemonic legacies are particularly important. The Ionians are going to go all out in searching for us, be it for the sake of those legacies or for the sake of that Omnigeddon blood fruit tree. In the end, they are still one of the six top organizations in the Endless Territories, and they've been around for a very long time. They'll probably have quite a few methods they can use to search for us. Agreed. Nine Dust nodded solemnly as well. Right. We have to be careful. We shouldn't tell anyone at all where we are. Ning agreed, only the two of us can know where we are. We can't tell anyone at all. As for those legacies, we didn't have enough time in the estate world to really meditate on them properly. We should find a suitable place to go into seclusion and train. Very well. Nine Dust laughed. I also feel that we need more time to train. The two quickly departed. After traveling for another 10 plus years they were deep within the Dao Alliance's territory, at which point they chose a planet to go into. Let's pick that planet. Swoosh. Swoosh. Ning and Nine Dust descended upon the surface of that planet. Clouds, come. Nine Dust stood at the top of that planet, letting out a loud shout. Instantly, a thick layer of clouds began to manifest over the planet, with a series of runic seals beginning to appear within the clouds. This separated them from the outside world, creating an independent local realm. Ning and Nine Dust wanted to avoid their auras from leaking outsides. Powerful world-level cultivators and Dao lords would often do something similar when they established an estate within a particular planet. Fogstone, one of the planets Ning had visited when he had first entered the Badlands territory, was a good example. Rain, descend. Nine Dust let out another loud shout. Instantly, a large amount of rain began to cascade downwards. Soon, lakes and even oceans began to form atop the formerly parched planet. Given Ning and Nine Dust's abilities, it took them just three days to completely transform this planet. 
It now had an atmosphere, clouds, lakes, oceans, countless types of vegetation, and even some simple insects and bugs were beginning to take form. Go. Nine Dust waved his hand, instantly causing some of the living beings he carried within his estate realm to emerge into this new world. This included tens of thousands of ordinary humans, as well as many types of animals, fish, and birds. Now, this planet truly was suitable for them to reside within. We didn't spend enough time within the Autarka's estate world, we didn't really analyze many of those hegemonic techniques in detail. Nine Dust said eagerly, after we do so, we might make great gains. Perhaps my chances at the Dao merge can be improved even further. I might be able to make some breakthroughs as well once I meditate on these hegemonic legacies. Ning was stuck at the final step and had been unable to break through to the last stage. Once he did, he would become a Tao Lord of the fourth step, at which point he truly would be able to roam the endless territories with impunity. Most likely, only the three mighty hegemons would be stronger than him, but that final step was incredibly hard to take. They were now being pursued by the Ionians. As a result, they decided to thoroughly study all of the 300-plus hegemonic legacies and entered secluded meditation. The Desolate Era Chapter 15, The Modern Three Realms Shortly after Ji Ning entered secluded meditation, he received word that his master patriarch Subhuti had returned to the Three Realms alongside Wind Fiend. The two were planning to break through to the Samsara Dao Lord level. The Three Realms Serpent Wing Lake Brightheart Island. The black robed Ning, Sub Hoodie, and Wind Fiend were seated close to each other, drinking wine and chatting. Brother Wind Fiend and I have spent hundreds of millions of years wandering the outside world. We have benefited greatly from our experiences and feel that it is time for us to break through to become Samsara Dao Lords, Sub Hoodie said with a laugh. Ha, huh, we've wandered the Badlands territory and even a number of the nearby territories. I don't want to brag but it is quite hard for us to find any world-level cultivators who are our equals. Wind Fiend seemed quite smug as well. Oh? Ning was surprised. Wind Fiend, Master, can the two of you give me a demonstration and show me the level you have reached? Very well. Wind Fiend smiled as a series of additional Wind Fiends began to appear in the area around them. Dozens of them appeared, all with different expressions and postures. Seeing this, Ning nodded slowly. For you to have reached such a level in the Tao of Wind, you must have mastered a Supreme Tao. Now watch Master's abilities. Subhuti put down his wine cup. Instantly, space-time in the surrounding area Abgon to ripple. Space itself seemed to transform as though this area was severed from the rest of the universe, and the speed of time began to change as well. It was like the three of them were aboard a small vessel, with the outside world being a river of space-time. Given Master's mastery over the Tao of space-time, he probably mastered a supreme Tao as well. Ning was rather stunned. It must be remembered that he had only left quite ordinary techniques to the three realms in the past. Those were all techniques he had acquired from Vast Heaven Palace, and there was nothing particularly impressive. For example, there were no hegemonic legacies. How was it that his master and Wind Fiend had both mastered a Supreme Tao each? It must be remembered that Ning had only gained his Omega Sword Tao thanks to his experiences in Vast Heaven Palace, in the Arceus region, and many other places. If it hadn't been for all of those things, he probably would be just slightly superior to Sub Hoodie and Wind Fiend. Master and Wind Fiend truly are monstrously talented, Ning sighed secretly in amazement. In truth, all of the immortals and fiend gods of the Three Realm were freakishly talented. Originally, they had no legacies at all, but they had managed to develop their own incredible techniques. Three purities, Tathagata, the three sovereigns of mankind, Hoi, Subhuti, they had all developed techniques that allowed them to fight those at a higher level, which meant that they vastly surpassed those on the same level in terms of insight into the Tao. Even the slightly weaker ones like Sun Wukong, Daoist Jade Cauldron, or Mithraya were still at a higher level of enlightenment than those in the outside world. Wind Fiend, Master, do not be in a rush to break through just yet, Ning said solemnly. I have just left a few truly top-tier techniques within the Three Realms archives. 
Go and check them out first. Truly top tier techniques? Subhoodie and Windfiend were both startled. The techniques you gave us previously were already quite good. Are there even better ones now? The two both looked at Ning. The two were incredibly talented, and as soon as they reached the world level they immediately reached a level of power where very few of their peers were able to defeat them. However, their experiences simply weren't as incredible as Ning, nor did they have as many fortuitous encounters. Thankfully, Ning had gifted the three realms with many techniques, otherwise, their talents would have gone to waste. You'll know once you go take a look, Ning said with a laugh. He didn't explain in detail. All right. We'll go take a look first. Both of them were deeply intrigued by Ning's secretive attitude, and they both hurried over to the Three Realms archives to take a look. The new additions Ning had just added into the Three Realms archives, included the world-level parts of the hegemonic legacies which Ning had gained. Ning watched as his master Subhoodie and Windfiend departed. His body flickered. Whoosh! He arrived in the void outside the Three Realms, where he stood by himself. More and more, I'm beginning to get the feeling that the Three Realms is an extraordinary place. Ning stared at the many spread out planets in the Three Realms, including the 3,000 major worlds and the trillions of minor worlds. When I was out adventuring through the outside world, I began to understand how unique the Three Realms are, but I didn't realize just how amazing it was. After a few hundred million years, though, the Three Realms have completely changed, Ning sighed in amazement. The Three Realms had undergone a gradual transformation, which was why Ning hadn't noticed anything at first. After hundreds of millions of years, however, the difference was quite drastic and apparent. Many years ago the most dazzling figures of the earlier eras, such as Daoist Three Purities, the Three Sovereigns of Mankind, Lord Tathagat of the Buddha, Hui, and Demonheart had all perished in battle. The survivors who were on par with them, Subhuti and Windfiend, were now close to becoming Samsara Dao lords, and extraordinary ones at that. As for the many elite figures like Sun Wukong, Buddha Mithraya, or Yang Jie, after hundreds of millions of years of cultivation, they had all broken through to the world level as well. Even Bright Moon had improved. Although she wasn't quite that talented, she had still been able to break through to become a celestial immortal thanks to her own efforts. Under Ning's guidance, she had actually reached the Elder God level. What's more, the success rates for immortals and fiend gods of the Three Realms breaking through to become celestial immortals was skyrocketing. Although some would fail and become loose immortals, many would reincarnate and eventually succeed in becoming celestial immortals. Only a small percentage were unlucky enough to actually perish to the celestial tribulation. The change was all-encompassing. Celestial Immortals, True Immortals, Ancestral Immortals, Chaos Immortals, after the Three Realms gained so many legacies, the breakthrough rates at every single level had skyrocketed. Everyone in the Three Realms is much talented than in the outside world, Ning sighed. The same was true for the Seamless Chaos World. The Immortals and Fiend Gods from the Seamless Chaos World were on par with that of the Pangu Chaos World. Ning grew increasingly curious. What made them so special? By now, Ning was definitely one of the major powers in the Endless Territories. He had reached the Archon level of power, and thus had a much broader vision than many. He knew that there were some Chaos Worlds, including the ones which Hegemons had labored over or ones like the Sith Worlds, which were quite special and which gave birth to living beings who were noticeably more talented than those in the rest of the world. What made the Three Realms so special? Perhaps it has something to do with the Azure Flower Estate, Ning mused. He then shook his head and chuckled. Only with enough strength could one act with confidence. Only when he took the final step and became a Tao Lord of the Fourth Step would he have reached the apex. When that happened, in all the Flame Dragon Realm verse the only ones more powerful than him would be the Three Hegemons. Wind Fiend had been the Lord of all Fiends of the Three Realms, the Supreme Leader of the Seamless Gate. He was the fastest person in all the three realms. Subhuti was a master of the Tao of space-time. His mastery of it had been supreme within the three realms. These two were exceedingly talented figures. 
After studying the world-level parts of the hegemonic legacies, they immediately began to seek to merge multiple supreme Daos together. After training for 120 million years, which translated into 10 billion accelerated years within his temporal acceleration treasure, Winfiend finally managed to merge three supreme Daos together, and he broke through to become a Samsara Dao Lord at one go. Subhuti was a bit slower. He had to train for over 300 million years, also using a temporal acceleration treasure. Finally, he also succeeded in merging multiple supreme Daos and became a Samsara Dao Lord. But of course, only the two of them reached such heights. The other immortals and fiend gods of the Three Realm were a bit weaker. Wind fiend, master, these legacies are critically important. I shall personally watch over these legacies, and anyone who wishes to study them must swear lifeblood oaths. If I perish, I will entrust them to you and wind fiend to watch over, Ning said solemnly. These were the copies of the hundreds of hegemonic legacies, and his primal twin had spent an extremely long period of time memorizing them. These legacies, Subhuti and Wind Fiend were absolutely stunned by the enormous repository of legacies in front of them. These legacies were of limited use to Ning, who trained in the Omega Sword Dao, but they would be of tremendous use to all other cultivators. This was far more valuable than anything Ning had acquired in the Brightshore Kingdom or the Arceus region. The existences of these legacies cannot be divulged in the slightest. Subhuti looked at Ning, his heart aching for his disciple. Disciple, don't put yourself under too much pressure when adventuring. Take things slowly, one step at a time. You've already done enough for the three realms. Dark North, be careful when out adventuring. Subhuti and I are still too weak, the three realms needs you standing guard over it, Wind Fiend said. After seeing the legacies, he understood just how weak he was. He was still just a Dao Lord of the first step, in the endless territories, he counted for absolutely nothing. All of Ning's loved ones were in the three realms. His father, Ji Yichuan, his mother, Yuchi Snow, his daughter, Ji Bright Moon. Sub Hoodie, Uncle White, Little Ching, Immortal Dian Tsai, Mu North Sun, Sun Wukong, and more were all here. Although Ning was often adventuring with the hope of reversing the flows of space-time and reviving his wife, he also cared tremendously about his other loved ones. Only if he could absolutely ensure their safety would he be able to truly lay rest to his concerns and go out adventuring. Brightmund A black-robed Ning was standing on the surface of Serpent Wing Lake. Father The white-robed Bright Moon was standing on the surface of the lake as well. Her life truly was relaxed and leisurely, with a peerless master of the Tao of the Sword like Ji Ning being her tutor and guide, everything was so simple. In fact, Ning even occasionally arranged for her to go out and explore the Badlands territory. Given Ning's current level of power, a single step was all it took for them to reach the Badlands territory. Let me see if your sword arts have improved or not, Ning said. Yes, father. Bright Moon smiled, followed by her sword light lighting up. A total of 3,600 immortal swords hung in the air around her. This was a terrifyingly powerful sword formation technique which Ning had passed down to her. For some reason, Bright Moon simply had no talent for training as a fiend god body refiner, and so she was focused on being a key refiner. Hush. Sword light covered the entire world. Ning began to spar against his daughter. He had been at the side of his daughter and his parents for hundreds of millions of years now. He had always dreamed of having Yu Wei by their side one day as well, accompanying him and watching as he taught their daughter swordplay. If that day ever came, he truly would be able to die with no regrets. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to an adventure fantasy novel. The Desolate Era Book 35, The Ionian Race Chapter 16, A Calamity Descends The black-robed primal twin Ji Ning spent all of its time within the Three Realms, accompanying his family members and enjoying a life of leisure. Ning's true body, however, continued to fearless advance and improve, not slacking off in the slightest. If he had, he wouldn't have reached such a terrifying level of power. A young man and a woman were standing at the prow of a large ship that was cruising through the waves of a vast sea. 
Senior apprentice brother, you've grown much more powerful and have reached the foundation stage. You'll definitely be ranked in the top three within our clan's tournament. In fact, you might even take first place, the green-robed woman said excitedly. I was able to reach the foundation stage, but the others might have made breakthroughs of their own. The clan competition will have 3,000 disciples competing within it. Seizing first place is not going to be an easy task, the black-robed youth said. His words were modest, but a hint of a smile was playing at his lips. He truly had made tremendous gains this time. He had no idea who that old fisherman was, but the man was incredibly powerful. That casual finger wave had contained unfathomably profundity within it. The black-robed youth stroked his chest. Where an ordinary-looking little rock was hanging from a necklace. The old fisherman had given it to him, and it contained an extremely profound set of staff arts within it. The clan competition? At my current level of power, the clan competition is nothing. My level of comprehension has skyrocketed so much that I should be able to break through to the core formation stage with ease. The black-robed youth's eyes gleamed. Far away, within a flying ship that was hidden in the mists above the world. Ji Ning and Nine Dust were seated aboard this ship. An old fisherman? Really? Nine Dust, you aren't exactly handsome, but there was no need for you to transform yourself into a roomy-eyed, white-haired old man, Ning said with a laugh. And you went out of your way to give that mortal some guidance. What, is he very talented? Why didn't I notice it? He's decent for a mortal, but to people like us he truly is nothing special. Nine Dust sighed. But, when I saw him, I felt as though I saw myself from long ago. That's why I decided to guide him. Ning was startled. Nine Dust was a very arrogant and solitary person who killed without blinking and was unscrupulous when pursuing his goals. However, he was willing to risk his own life to aid those he viewed as friends. That young mortal youth was similarly a solitary and lonely figure, but he was just as willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of that junior apprentice sister of his. He's a lucky kid, Ning said. You and I remade this world when we chose to set up our estate here, bringing countless living beings into existence, Nine Dust said smugly. Thus, we are responsible for guiding and teaching them. You? Guide and teach? Ning shook his head. The living beings on this world had already gone through the earliest barbarian days, discovered primitive cultivation techniques, experienced a dazzling golden age, suffered through a great apocalypse, and finally entered the current, fairly stable era. Ning truly did work attentively to guide this world, but Nine Dust? He was a much harder-hearted figure than Ning. He didn't give a damn about whether the living beings here lived or died. Nine Dust occasionally taught some people, but it was strictly due to sudden spurts of interest. For example, just now he transformed into a fisherman and transmitted a set of staff arts to the kid, then tossed him a stone. That was it. He didn't even teach the kid an actual cultivation technique. Eh. Ning and Nine Dust's faces suddenly tightened. Let's go, Ning barked. Whoosh. The flying vessel disappeared as Ning and Nine Dust instantly departed from this planet and arrived in the void beyond it. What's going on? Why are the realmship fragments we found in the Sith ruins resonating? Ning frowned. Mine is resonating as well. My realmship fragment is trembling right now, as though it wants to fly in a certain direction. Nine Dust pointed towards a direction which led into the chaotic void. The two each had part of the shattered realmship. Both of those parts were shaking right now, wanting to go flying off in a certain direction. Something's wrong, Ning said. When we scavenged the realmship wreckage in the Sith ruins, we each collected a fairly undamaged piece. There's never been a resonance like this before. Now that there is a sudden resonance, it has to have something to do with the Sith. Shall we go take a look? Nine Dust asked. Yes, let's go take a look. Ning nodded. Both of them were bold due to their power. This thing which was resonating with their realmship fragments could very well be a great fortune. Realmships were treasures which even hegemons would go wild over, after all. Ning led Nine Dust in tearing through space-time and advancing. 
Wait, something's wrong. As soon as they exited the space-time tear, Ning's face tightened. I can sense that the distance between us and the resonance is rapidly decreasing. They're moving towards us as well. Yes, they are headed in our direction. Nine Dust's face turned grim as well. For the resonance to grow stronger and stronger meant that the distance was clearly decreasing. A skinny man with white eyebrows and deep green eyes was standing within the chaotic void. He was dressed in long white robes and had white hair. His oily green eyes emanated an insidious coldness that was more than enough to inspire terror in the hearts of other cultivators. He was one of the most awe-inspiring members of the Tao Alliance, one of the eight Archons of the Sacred Cities. Archon Silks now. Silks now, this sounded like a woman's Taoist title, but he was indeed a man. Archon Silks now was an extremely evil individual. Comparing Sect Lord Time Dream to him was like comparing an innocent baby with a demon who had mass murdered over a trillion people. According to the legends, Archon Silks now had been born within a great apocalypse where countless living beings had died. As a rain of blood fell from the skies, an infant came crawling out of the torn open belly of his deceased mother. The child was savage and bloodthirsty by nature, and he was inconceivably talented when it came to cultivation. His path of cultivation was one of slaughter and an endless sea of blood. Nobody could stop him. Nobody. He actually trained all the way up at one go, succeeding in his Tao merge and becoming one of the eight archons of the sacred cities. He was definitely a dominating and overwhelmingly powerful figure, and the countless bloodthirsty, violent cultivators of the endless territories all submitted to his rule. In fact, there were quite a few extremely violent emperors who chose to follow him. In the Tao Alliance, he was ranked third amongst the eight archons of the sacred cities. He was one of the truly terrifying figures of the Tao Alliance. Eh. Archon Silks now stared towards a certain direction with his oily green eyes. It's coming from over there. My realm ship is resonating powerfully with something in that direction. An excited look flashed through Archon Silksnow's eyes. Master, master. It's another part of a realm ship. It's another part. The vessel spirit of his tattered realm ship was extremely excited. Excellent. Archon Silksnow's white eyebrows fluttered. I'll take it for you. In all the endless territories, the only ones Archon Silksnow feared were the three mighty hegemons. He held no fear towards any of the other experts at all. It must be remembered that he had slaughtered his way to becoming a dominating figure. How could he possibly fear others? Swoosh! A streak of snow-white saber light tore through space-time. Archon Silks now stepped into the tunnel, traversing through space-time towards the direction of the resonance. It's moving closer to us, and it's moving incredibly fast much faster than me when I tear through space-time. Ning turned pale. Nine Dust, we need to leave immediately. Even faster than you? Nine Dust was startled as well. The difference in speed at which one tore through the void in order to travel was a testament to a difference in insight. Ning immediately led Nine Dust in a frantic retreat. They are starting to run. Archon Silks now gently stroked his long, droopy white eyebrows. They won't be able to flee. He continued to tear through space-time in hot pursuit. Ning fled at full speed, wanting to flee somewhere safe such as the Brightshore Kingdom or one of the sacred cities. He's too fast. We won't be able to make it. Ning gritted his teeth. It seems our only choice is to pick a battlefield to fight him head-on. Nine Dust, set up your formations right away, Ning sent. We need to pick the battlefield then set up formations and await his arrival. Fine. Nine Dust nodded. Judging from how fast the person was, that person should have reached a higher level of enlightenment than Ning. How strong he actually was, however, would only be determined through actual combat. Focus. Nine Dust immediately tossed out a black globe. As the black globe flew out, it quickly flew towards a distant, desolate planet. It merged itself into the planet, causing a layer of black light to appear on the planet's surface. Countless runes could be seen flickering over the surface of the black light. Hide, 
Nine Dust growled. The countless black runes all turned reserved and stately. Ning produced a treasure as well. This was a treasure he had acquired from the Sith ruins, a deep blue necklace that looked broken. Ning tossed it out, and it immediately flew towards that planet and merged into its depths. Ning and Nine Dust both flew towards that planet and landed on its surface. They only had enough time to set up three layers of defenses before they sensed a powerful aura appear off in the distance. A white-robed, white-haired, white-browed man tore straight through the void and appeared before them, his eyebrows fluttering in the astral wind. He turned to stare in their direction with his oily green eyes. Although he was very thin, Ning and Nine Dust didn't feel that he was small at all, they only felt an utterly terrifying and dominating aura spread out towards them. Archon Silks now. Ning and Nine Dust both turned pale. They never would have imagined that their opponent was the most savage and brutal of the eight lords of the sacred cities. Archon Silks now. The Desolate Era. Chapter 17, Negotiations. Archon Silksnow's eyebrows fluttered, a look of surprise flashing through his oily green eyes. He then let out a cold chuckle, you fled quite fast. I had thought that it was an emperor, who would have thought it was you two kids. Greetings, Archon Silksnow, Ji Ning and Nine Dust both bowed modestly. Humph, Archon Silksnow let out a cold snort. Instantly, a blurry aura of light appeared which covered an area of 10 billion kilometers. Space-time in this region was completely severed from the outside world. This caused Ning and Nine Dust to turn pale. Archon Silksnow then made his move. Whoosh! He suddenly charged downwards, leaving a streak of light behind in the skies as he arced downwards like curved saber light. An aura of supreme coldness pierced towards them, seeming to penetrate their souls and true souls. It was simply too fast. This strike was the fastest saber strike Ning had ever seen, so fast that Ning felt a sense of panic. It was also too cold. The saber intent from this strike caused Ning's very true soul to shiver from the cold. This was the level which a true lord of the sacred cities was at. The golems Ning had previously encountered, as well as the flaming beasts and sea dragons he had encountered in the estate world, were extremely strong and extremely fast but much inferior when it came to actual insights into the mysteries of the Tao. In terms of insight and understanding, this Archon Silks now definitely surpassed Ning in every regard. What? Ning and Nine Dust were both shocked. They didn't expect for Archon Silks now to almost immediately attack after saying just a few words. Clearly, he wanted to take their lives. Clang. 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 Ning immediately manifested three heads and six arms, drawing all six North Bow swords and executing his Omega Sword Dao, Soulheart in a full power defense. Faced with such a terrifying strike, Ning didn't even think about counterattacking. His only thought was to hold and defend. First. Three of his swords just barely managed to intercept the saber light, and as they did a surge of cold energy seemed to slam into and through him like a giant hammer, crushing him with its power. Boom! Ning was immediately knocked flying backwards. He slammed into the ground of the planet, causing the planet to shudder and enormous crevices and gorges to appear on its surface which were hundreds of kilometers long. The planet now looked like a cracked turtle shell. He's too powerful. Nine Dust didn't even dare to block, instead transforming into a wave of water which frantically retreated. Swish. Archon Silks now used the saber in his left hand to strike at Ning. As for the saber in his right hand, he hacked at Nine Dust with it. Slash. The vast stream of water that was Nine Dust was cut in half from the very center, and a low growl could be heard emanating from within it. Moments later, the two streams of water quickly began to flee. Only when they fled next to Ning did they reform into a single fleshly body. Ning had flown out of the gorge. He stood alongside Nine Dust, ugly looks on their faces. I've already reached the Archon level, but I never imagined that the difference between me and an actual Archon of a sacred city would be so great. Ning's heart was shaking. Too powerful. He's too powerful. My invulnerable aquaform has been highly perfected, but he was still able to heavily injure me with one blow. 
Nine Dust's face was rather ashen. He sent mentally, Dark North, this Archon Silks now is too powerful. He'd probably be able to kill me in just ten or so blows. Ning nodded slightly. Invulnerable forms weren't truly invincible. When Emperor Soul Sky had been a Dao Lord, he had been heavily injured by Fiend Queen Dust Rain. If an enemy was at a sufficiently high level of power, not even an invulnerable form could completely nullify the attack. Hmm, Dao Lord Dark North, no wonder you rose to preeminence in the Wave Shift realm. Archon Silks now stared at Ning with his oily green eyes. Your friend, the Nine Dust Sect Lord, has an invulnerable aqua form, but I was able to injure him heavily. You, however, you weren't injured by my strike at all. Ha, huh, given your level of power, you should have reached the Archon level by now. However, you are still far from being a match for me. Archon Silks now smiled a cold, blood-curdling smile. I've always had the habit of striking with full power when I attack, even if my target is a Dao Lord. The two of you can die now. Archon Silks now suddenly manifested a total of six arms, with each arm gripping a saber. Wait! Nine Dust called loudly. Oh? Archon Silks now looked coldly at Ning and Nine Dust. Is there something which the two of you wish to say? Archon Silks now, we are just Dao Lords, there's no way we can match an Archon like yourself. If there's something you want, you can just tell us, Ning said. Yes, Archon. If there's something you want, we can negotiate, Nine Dust agreed hurriedly. Although the two had set up quite a few formations on this planet, they still weren't confident in their chances. They had quite a few treasures, yes, but would the most savage of the eight lords of the sacred cities, Archon Silks now, possibly have fewer treasures than them? He probably had more than ten times as many as they did. Even worse, their earlier clash had already shown Ning and Nine Dust how huge the power gap between them was. Nine Dust would probably be slain within just ten strikes. As for Ning? He knew just how big the gap between him and his foe was. Archon Silks now was highly ranked even for one of the lords of the sacred cities, and he was incredibly powerful. He had also been alive for an extremely long period of time. Although he didn't have a universe treasure, he did have lifeblood weapons. Those lifeblood weapons had grown over the course of many years to become just as powerful as Ning's Northbow swords. Ning didn't even have an advantage in weaponry. As for insight into the Dao? He was superior to Supreme Dao Lords, yes, but there was a clear difference between him and the Archons. That saber strike from earlier, it was superior to Ning's sword arts in every single aspect. Ning's Soulheart stance was able to mitigate some of his disadvantages, but the difference in power was still great. The difference in power was so great that Ning might not be able to escape even if he used up his treasures. It really wasn't worth it for him to risk and sacrifice so much just for a battered piece of a realm ship. Ning and Nine Dust stared at the blurry glow surrounding them for 10 billion kilometers. Archon Silks now had immediately used a treasure to block out the surrounding spacetime continuum, from this, they could tell how determined Archon Silks now was. He was definitely going to acquire the realm ship parts, no matter what the cost. Ning could also sense that his sword arts were no longer capable of tearing through spacetime. If he used the Hegemon spacetime disc, he might be able to succeed, but he also might fail in his attempt to flee. His foe was a lord of the sacred cities, after all. Ning truly wasn't confident in his chances. Negotiate? You wish to negotiate with me? Archon Silks now stared downwards at Ning and Nine Dust. Yes, negotiate. Nine Dust said hurriedly, Archon, you probably came for the sake of our realm ship parts, right? To tell you the truth, we brothers sense the resonance as well. That's why we immediately fled. If there's anything you wish from us, Archon, just tell us, Ning said. Faced with such a legendary tyrant, they had no choice but to lower their heads. Archon Silks knows most. Famous action came during a gathering of emperors in the Dao Alliance's Palace of Immortals. Archon Silks now ended up being angered by a dispute caused by clashing interests with the other emperors. He had suppressed his rage when still inside the palace, 
but after they all left he actually consecutively killed the twelve eternal emperors who had offended him. This was something which had rendered everyone in the endless territories completely speechless. To occasionally kill a few enemy emperors due to personal feuds was one thing, but to kill twelve of them because of a fit of pique? This was absolutely crazy. This was why he was famous for being the most savage and bloodthirsty of the eight lords of the sacred cities. He was a madman. He was also incredibly strong and had many trump cards ready to play. He had offended and angered many with his actions, and had incurred the displeasure of the other archons as well. As a result, there had been a great battle which had spanned multiple chaos cycles and resulted in innumerable casualties, but in the end the matter was simply dropped. Realmship? Archon Silks now glanced at them, a not-quite smile playing at his lips. The two of us would naturally keep this information completely secret, Nine Dust said hurriedly. We are willing to swear oaths that we will definitely keep this secret. You two are quite clever. When you sensed how fast I was moving towards you, you immediately chose to flee. Archon Silks now glanced at Ning. Dao Lord Dark North is extremely powerful, if I was just slightly weaker, I probably wouldn't be able to do anything to him. However, the difference in power between us is too great for you to overcome. Archon Silks now nodded. Since you are willing to bow your heads, I'll give you a way to survive. Ning and Ninedust both looked at Archon Silks now. First, you must give me all of your treasures, save for your weapons and your armor, Archon Silks now said. Second, you are not to resist and must allow me to read through your memories and your soul. Don't worry, I'll swear an oath not to harm your souls or true souls in the slightest, I simply wish to scan them. Ning and Nine Dust turned grim. Nine Dust said angrily, Archon, don't go too far. Ning's face turned as cold as ice as well. Scan their memories? The two were incredibly proud figures. How could they be willing to allow others to rifle through their memories? Ning wasn't willing to hand over all of his treasures either. The Omnigeddon Bloodfruit Tree and the Verdant Azure Soul were both incredibly precious treasures. The latter had been personally fashioned by Autark Bolan and was capable of controlling a Chaos Primordial. The Desolate Era. Chapter 18, Spacetime Disc. Humph. Once I kill you, I'll still end up with your treasures, Archon Silks now said coldly. I'm at least willing to let you keep your weapons and your armor, this is an unusual display of mercy from me. As for searching through your memories. I merely wish to learn where you acquired the realmship parts from. Realmships were relics created by the Sith. Since Ji Ning and Nine Dust had somehow acquired realmship parts, Archon Silks now felt certain that they must have visited Sith ruins. Every single Sith ruins was akin to a treasure trove, Archon Silks now naturally wished to learn everything he could above such a place. Search through my memories? I'd choose death over that, Nine Dust said coldly. Archon, we can give you the realmship parts. We can also swear to keep it all a secret, Ning said coldly. If you accept, we'll hand over the parts right away. If you refuse, our only choice will be to do battle. Ha ha ha, Archon Silks now raised his head and began to laugh loudly, his laughter echoing throughout the sealed region of 10 billion kilometers. You dare to try and haggle with me? A savage, murderous look appeared in his oily green eyes, then die. Boom. 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 Six streams of dazzling, enormous saber light chopped downwards towards Ning and Nine Dust like curved moons. Let's do this. Ning and Nine Dust exchanged a glance, no longer hesitating at all. Arise. Nine Dust growled. Instantly, a layer of black light filled with countless flickering runes erupted on the surface of the planet. Space in the area around the planet seemed to have been completely frozen, causing the six curved streaks of saber light to slow down. Moments later, blood-colored formation flags appeared throughout the planet, causing it to descend into a sea of blood. Finally, a series of roaring beast phantoms appeared. A total of 19 beast phantoms charged straight towards Archon Silks now. Go. Ning activated the treasures he had set down as well. Clank clank clank. 
A series of deep blue chains appeared out of nowhere behind Archon Silks now, coiling towards him in an attempt to bind him. A massive formation appeared as well, transforming the skies into an enormous white chessboard. Directly below the planet, an enormous black chessboard appeared within the void. These two giant chessboards slowly swiveled, causing endless streams of light to connect them together in a cage around Archon Silks now. Crack. Boom. Dark gold lightning flickered and crashed downwards towards Archon Silks now as well. Quite a few treasures. Archon Silks now smiled coldly. Ning and Nine Dust truly were being quite cautious. They had set up treasures and formations of tremendous power. Although Archon Silks now was extremely strong, these things would still tie him down for a period of time. Break. Archon Silks now let out a savage laugh as a golden disc flew out of his body. The disc rose vertically, its edges incredibly sharp. It emanated a ripple of terrifying power. Tyethirding. The disc emanated an ear-piercing sound that caused the hearts of Ning and Nine Dust to tremble. It suddenly expanded in size, becoming almost as large as the planet itself as it spun in a chopping manner at the planet. Clang. Archon Silks now wielded a warblade in each of his six arms, effortlessly blocking the deep blue chains that were coiling towards him from behind. Slash. The giant spinning disc was able to forcibly cut through everything in its path, breaking through all of the various formations. It must be remembered that even Archon Silks now would have been able to spend quite some time and energy breaking through these formations if he was relying on his own power. Now, however, he used the disc to blow through them like rotting deadwood. All of the formations atop the giant planet were instantly destroyed, and even the planet itself was chopped in half before the remaining power of the disc was used up. Finally, the disc crumbled apart and dissipated. Ning and Nine Dust were both rather caught off guard. Our formations clearly weren't capable of killing him. Why did he have to use a treasure to tear through them like that? Ning's face was ashen. Archon Silks now is famous for his overbearing manner. I finally understand what that entails. Nine Dust felt a sense of grief. Die. After having destroyed the entire planet the two were on, Archon Silks now charged straight towards Ning and Nine Dust. Ning waved his hand, pulling Nine Dust into his estate world. Nine Dust, I'll come up with a way to escape. I think I have a chance of fleeing, but if I cannot, just pray. Dark North. Nine Dust gritted his teeth after being drawn into the estate world. However, he knew that the difference in power between him and Archon Silks now was simply far too great. Ning might be able to struggle for a bit, but it would be suicide for Nine Dust to try and fight as well. After putting Nine Dust away, Ning immediately charged into the skies and began to fly even higher. Break. Ning attempted to tear through space, but the blurry golden light which covered an area of 10 billion kilometers around them caused spacetime to stabilize to such a degree that there was no way to tear through it at all. Let's go. Ning produced a strange black and white disc in his hands. This was the spacetime disc which he Gem and Brightshore had given him all those years ago. He instantly activated the power hidden within it, causing a terrifying ripple of might to descend and envelope him, then tear forcibly through the frozen spacetime. Rumble, the vast halo of golden light began to shudder as though it was trying to suppress the effects of the item. What? Archon Silks now revealed a look of shock. Is that, a spacetime disc? He Gemin Brightshore's spacetime disc. Given how long he had been around for, Archon Silks now was naturally quite familiar with this type of spacetime disc. In truth, all of the top-tier elites of the Endless Territories knew how much he Gem and Brightshore cared about his royal clan, the Brightshore Imperials, and how much he cared about the Dao Lords of the Twelve Palaces. For he Gem and Brightshore to bestow a spacetime disc upon a Dao Lord was a sign that the he Gem and viewed that person with great favor. Most major powers would give face upon seeing it and not act against the person in question. Humph. For the sake of the realmship and the Sith legacies, I'll just bear the consequences," Archon Silks now said with a cold smile. The power of the spacetime disc was doing its best to tear through spacetime, 
while the 10 billion kilometers of blurry light was doing its best to stabilize and suppress it. The two were battling against each other. Crack. The black-white disc in Ning's hand suddenly and completely shattered apart. The blurry light covering the surrounding area was now much dimmer, but it was still there. It failed. Ning was stunned. This was the most formidable escape treasure he had available to him, but he still hadn't been able to breach the frozen field of space-time. What should I do now? Ning's heart was ice cold. His most formidable fleeing treasure had failed, while he wasn't strong enough to overcome his opponent, what was he to do? If he Gemin Brightshore was here in person, he might be able to breach this field, but that treasure of yours was nothing more than something he created and infused with part of his power. He's gifted them to quite a few Dao Lords. If that's all you have, you won't be able to escape, and if you won't be able to escape, you are going to die. That Nine Dust Sect Lord hiding in your estate world will die as well. Archon Silksnow's voice boomed outwards. He surpassed Ning in every single aspect, save for the Heart Sword, Art. Ning's Heart Sword, Art was still took weak, he had merely reached the tenth stance and was still at the first stage of it. It simply couldn't make up of the overwhelming disparity in power between the two. If Ning was like Emperor Heartsword and had mastered all fifteen stances, he would be truly and freakishly powerful. Alas, breaking through each stage of the Heartsword was simply too difficult, as was making a breakthrough with the Omega Sword Dao. I can't die. If I die, Nine Dust is doomed as well. Ning felt a powerful urge to stay alive. If he died, he would be revived thanks to the Dao seal he had acquired in that alternate universe, but his weapons and treasures would all be gone. The nine novescence arts and the protective divine ability he had trained in would be lost as well. The loss of the treasures was secondary, as he would be able to come back to life. Nine Dust, however, could not. Nine Dust didn't even have a primal twin. Die then. Archon Silks now had already appeared in front of him. I cannot lose. I cannot be defeated. I still have a chance, a tiny chance. A terrifying blaze of light appeared in Ning's eyes. Time to go all out. This sort of deadly battle is extremely effective in helping one understand sword arts better. I've been training in seclusion for hundreds of millions of years, but I still haven't been able to reach the fourth stage of my Omega Sword Dao. Perhaps if I gain enough insights from this fight, it'll aid me in making my breakthrough. If I can reach the fourth stage of the Omega Sword Dao, not only will I be able to stay alive, I'll be able to win. Ning's eyes were blazing with unshakable resolve. Die. Archon Silksnow's saber light descended. It was so cold as to freeze Ning's heart, so fast as to cause Ning to shudder. This time, Archon Silksnow struck out at Ning with all six sabers at the same time. Clearly, he wanted to leave nothing up to chance at all and was seeking to slay Ning with one attack. I absolutely have to block this. Ning strove to execute his sword arts, generating an enormous black hole around him which sought to devour all of the saber light. Boom! This collision was far larger than the last one. Ning was sent flying through the air, a line of blood leaking out from the corner of his lips. Huh, you really have some power after all. I used six sabers and struck at you with my full power. I thought that I'd be able to reduce you to dust, but you only suffered a few light wounds. Your protective divine ability truly is formidable. Archon Silksnow's voice echoed through the void as he continued to charge after Ning, not pausing at all. Thankfully, his strikes are within the realm of what I can endure. Ning licked the blood from his lips. Although he's strong, he won't be able to kill me. Given my hegemon armor and my protective divine ability, only a real hegemon should be able to crush my body in one shot. I still have a chance. I still have a chance. You were able to block me once, but will you be able to block ten times? A hundred times? You are doomed. Archon Silksnow's oily green eyes were filled with an awesome savagery. The Desolate Era. Chapter 19, A Single Tear. Ji Ning wasn't a fool, nor was he foolishly overconfident. Although he hoped to be able to make use of this deadly battle to break through his current bottleneck, 
he knew that there were too many variables in play here. He might actually be able to make a breakthrough, but it was more likely that he would fail. Breaking through the bottleneck to become a Tao Lord of the Fourth Step was no easy task, after all. Ning's path was that of the Omega Sword Tao, if he wanted to break through, it would be even harder than it had been for Nine Dust and harder than it would be for Badlands. He didn't dare to completely entrust all his hopes into making a breakthrough. Thus, as soon as the space-time disk failed he immediately asked Hegemon Brightshore for aid. Send word to Hegemon Brightshore. Tell him that Dao Lord Dark North is willing to give him 50 of the Cold Flame Cauldron Fruits and all the remaining fruits from Crimson Wave Temple, in order to request the Hegemon to intervene and save his life. Archon Silks now is currently trying to kill him, and he can die at any moment, Ning instructed the servant who was in charge of maintaining contact between him and the Brightshore Kingdom. Yes, master. The servant was shocked upon hearing how grim the situation was, and he immediately sent word over to the Brightshore Kingdom. I hope the Hegemon will intervene, Ning mused to himself. The Hegemon was an exalted figure who was the supreme leader of the entire Brightshore Kingdom. To the supreme figures of the Endless Territories, a Dao Lord really didn't count for much, no matter how monstrously talented the Dao Lord was. This was because the more talented a Dao Lord was, the lower his chances of succeeding in the Dao Merge would be. The Brightshore Kingdom had its twelve palaces, but in all of its years of existence none of its supreme Dao Lords had ever succeeded in the Dao Merge. Hegemon Brightshore remained the one and only Hegemon of the Brightshore Kingdom. Thus, Hegemons generally didn't care about whether Dao Lords died or not. For them to perish while out adventuring was quite normal. They'd calmly watch as one generation of Dao Lords after another rose to power, followed by one generation after another perishing. But 50 Cold Flame Cauldron Fruits might be enough to convince the Hegemon to intervene. Although the Hegemon managed to trade for some of that fruit after our trip to Crimson Wave Temple, I don't think he got 50, Ning prayed. Master, Master. The Hegemon sends word that he is heading towards you with my clone. However, he is going to need some time. He asks you to hold on for a bit, the servant immediately replied. Boom. Right at this moment, Ning had been knocked backwards with blood leaking from the corner of his lips. He couldn't help but feel delighted upon hearing this. Good. I need to hold on for a bit. If I can hold on for a while, the Hegemon will be able to make it here, Ning thought eagerly. He knew that since the Hegemon wasn't sure as to where he was exactly, the Hegemon needed his servant to guide the way. That delay, combined with what a great distance the Hegemon had to traverse via tearing through spacetime, meant that the Hegemon did need some time before he could arrive. Normally, such a short period of time was meaningless. However, Ning was in the middle of a life and death battle against someone who was one of the lords of the sacred cities. That short period of time was quite long in this situation, more than enough for Archon Silksnow to strike a hundred times. Arise. Archon Silksnow's long hair fluttered behind him as he let out a loud shout. Boom. Countless streams of saber key flew out from around him, forming a vast world of saber energy that crashed down upon Ning. Clearly, Archon Silks now wished to end this battle as quickly as possible. Come forth. Ning didn't dare to hold anything back at all. Nine energy dragons immediately flew out of his body, forming the Inyang Chaos Domain as his awesome Heart World projection came crashing down as well. The Heart World projection merged into the Inyang Chaos Domain, then clashed straight against the surrounding world of Saber Key. The two domains collided against each other and the Saber Key domain was actually at a slight disadvantage. This caused Archon Silks now to feel rather flabbergasted. He then smiled coldly, so you have a few tricks of your own. However, you are still going to die. Archon Silks now charged straight towards Ning with pure, unadulterated savagery. His six sabers executed his exceptionally brutal and valiant Tao of the Saber. Before his sabers, even space-time was frozen and even karma was severed. Attack! 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 I have to survive. For Nine Dust's sake if nothing else, I have to survive. Ning labored to defend himself. Boom! Boom! 
Boom. The battle between the two caused the skies to darken. Archon Silks now lived up to his reputation as one of the top three Archons. His attacks were incredibly ferocious, which only made sense, the Dao of the Saber was an offensive Dao, after all. Ning was completely unable to fight back, but when he focused completely on defense his six swords were able to form a truly airtight defense. Still, he was knocked backwards again and again. This Dao Lord Dark North really is pretty formidable. Archon Silks now struck out ten times in a row, but Ning was able to endure all ten attacks. This caused Archon Silks now to narrow his eyes. Everyone says that Weinzage is the most powerful Dao Lord, but it seems as though this Dao Lord Dark North is actually more powerful than Weinzage. I can hardly believe that there's a Dao Lord capable of taking ten blows from me in a row. In truth, Ning was only able to accomplish this thanks to his, Heart Sword, Art, which had increased his strength dramatically and made his sword arts even faster and more ferocious. Without it, Archon Silks now probably would have been able to blast Ning's six swords out of his hands and then kill Ning right away. He's too resilient. If this continues, I don't even know how many attacks it'll take to kill him. A cold light flashed through Archon Silksnow's oily green eyes. Forget it. I'll make an exception for him and use my, Ice Snow, Saber Arts. Whoosh. Archon Silksnow's six sabers began to move in unison. Three of them became incredibly savage and overbearing, while the other three actually became unpredictable and ephemeral, almost like the dancing of the snow. Their movements were very soft and extremely difficult to see through. When Ning saw this, his face turned extremely pale. Although the earlier attacks were savage and powerful, they were fairly easy to block as a result. Now that Archon Silks now was using this strange combination of savagery and softness, merging the principles of Yin and Yang together, blocking the attacks became far more difficult than before. The snow-like saber arts didn't have as much power behind them, but they were much more troublesome for Ning to defend against. It was much like how the Heavenbreaker stance was much more powerful than the Blood Drop stance, but the Blood Drop stance was far superior in speed thanks to having sacrificed a degree of power. The most powerful attack wasn't necessarily the best attack. Clang. Clang. Slash. Slash. Swords and sabers collided non-stop. Ning was forced to use four of his swords to defend against those three sabers executing the unpredictable, ice snow, saber art, leaving him only two swords to defend against the other three extremely savage sabers. Boom. Using just two swords to defend clearly wasn't enough. A savage burst of power rocked Ning's entire body, causing it to tremble as he was sent flying backwards. Ning vomited out a mouthful of blood, his face ashen. His divine power was being depleted far too quickly. Ning's hands were numb, and even his soul was beginning to feel a bit woozy. Clearly, his sword arts weren't able to ablate enough of his enemy's attack power, causing his divine body to endure most of it. As a result, his injuries were now much heavier than before. After I became one of the Archons of the Sacred Cities, on the occasions when I acted against Dao Lords I always used my most powerful and overwhelming attacks to crush them directly. You are the first Dao Lord I wasn't able to crush in such a manner, forcing me to use my, Ice Snow, Saber Arts. Normally, I'll only use it when I battle against other Emperors. You should feel proud to die these saber arts, Archon Silks now said as he once more charged forwards. His saber arts fell upon Ning like the snow, drifting and ephemeral. His saber light flashed like lightning, piercing directly into one's heart. These were two diametrically different types of saber arts, making it far more difficult to defend against them. Slash. Ning was starting to grow dizzy from the hits he was taking. His divine body found it hard to endure these attacks, and he was starting to decline from peak condition. No. If I let this continue, I'm going to die. Ning understood that each time he blocked, he was walking on a fine line between life and death. In less than ten stances, he would perish to this opponent. If I die, I can be revived thanks to my Dao seal, but Nine Dust will be dead for sure. A surge of indomitable will and resolve came out of Ning's soul. 
This resolve was absolutely unshakable, a form of power that came from his very spirit, and Ning's sword art suddenly changed. Previously, his strikes had taken the form of mist-formed swords. All of a sudden, the mist began to condense and transform into drops of water. The countless water drops condensed into a sword that looked as though it was made out of water. The watery swords rippled with absolute beauty but emanated a mesmerizing level of might, and both the speed and power of Ning strikes skyrocketed. Heart Sword, Stance 11. Teardrop. Boom. Boom. The two forces collided. Ning was still knocked flying backwards, and he was still at a disadvantage, but this time, he didn't spit out any blood at all. Clearly, the force of the collision was not enough to cause him any injuries. What? Archon Silksnow's face completely changed. The eleventh stance of the, heart sword, art? Yes. The distant Ning revealed a smile. Archon Silksnow, you live up to your reputation. You recognized my technique at a single glance. This is indeed the eleventh stance of the, heart sword, art. The reason why it was comparatively easier for cultivators to make breakthroughs in near-death situations was because those situations placed the soul and true soul under enormous pressure, causing them to enter a special state that made it easier for one to have epiphanies and then make breakthroughs. Ning wasn't just in a life-and-death situation, he was also under the pressure of being responsible for Nindust's survival. This made his desire to win even stronger, and those strong emotions and tremendous desire to survive caused his heart sword, art to finally break through. In the instant that he made his breakthrough, he finally understood. The eleventh stance of the, heart sword, art, the, teardrop, required incredible resolve and willpower. Long ago, Emperor Heart Sword had been facing certain death for the sake of protecting those he loved. He had smiled into the face of death as tears spilled down his face, but in that instant, he had a sudden epiphany and managed to develop the eleventh stance. Each cultivator had their own paths to take if they wished to create such profound, abstruse sword arts. God Emperor Helong, for example, had created his, God Emperor's Apocalypse, technique, a technique similar to the, heart sword, art in that it perfectly merged heart force, divine power, and immortal energy together. It also required a terrifying amount of resolve and strong emotions, but the emotions involved had to be a feeling of benevolence and care towards all living beings. Only such a blazing level of determination can allow heart force, divine power, and immortal energy to merge together in a more perfect manner. Ning finally understood. The Desolate Era. Chapter 20, Hegemon Brightshore. How is this possible? How could his, heart sword, art have advanced to the eleventh stance? That means he'll reach the twelfth stance soon. The first stage of the, heart sword, Art consisted of the 8th to 10th stances, while the second stage consisted of the 11th and 12th stances. Ning had made consecutive breakthroughs in the first stage back when he was in Crimson Wave Temple. Breaking through between stances within the same stage was quite fast, while breaking through from one stage to another was far more difficult. Since Ning had already reached the 11th stance, the 12th stance wouldn't be too far behind. Daolord Dark North's sword arts are extremely well-rounded and extremely durable. If he can master the twelfth stance, he'll be on par with even me. Archon Silksnow's killing intent began to grow stronger. Emperor Heart Sword, even after becoming an eternal emperor, was only comparable to Supreme Daolords when it came to his actual insights into the Dao of the Sword. He was actually weaker in this regard than the current Ning. However, Thanks to his mastery of the fifteenth stance of the, heart sword, art, he had completely eclipsed all other archons and was second only to the hegemons. He was known throughout the endless territories as the only emperor who was comparable to hegemons in power. Now that Ning had mastered the eleventh stance, the power of his strikes was three times as much as it was normally. Soon, when he mastered the twelfth stance, his strikes would be comparable to six times his normal power. How incredible would this be? It was all thanks to this terrifying technique that Emperor Heart Sword had been able to battle those who were two levels of power above him and be able to battle the three mighty hegemons. Boom! 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 The two continued to battle furiously. Ning was knocked flying repeatedly, 
but he was able to endure the blows with ease. This was because his sword arts were faster and fiercer than before, allowing him to completely defend against his foe's attacks. A hundred strikes? I can block even a thousand strikes from him. He might hold the upper hand, but if I completely focus on defense I can endure fairly easily. Die, die, die. Archon Silksnow's oily green eyes grew colder and colder as his saber arts fluctuated between incomparable savagery and snow-like unpredictability. Ning was completely unable to fight back at all, and with each strike he sent Ning flying away. He was completely dominating Ning, forcing Ning to focus exclusively on defense, but Archon Silksnow really was completely unable to do anything to the defense-oriented Ning. His defenses are completely without flaws. His sword arts have no weaknesses whatsoever. Archon Silksnow was extremely vexed by this, foes with perfect defensive abilities were extremely difficult to deal with. Even those more powerful than Ning would find it hard to breach his defensive sword arts. Am I really going to have to use one of my treasures to deal with a single Dao Lord? Given his current level of power, not even common hegemon level treasures are certain to kill him. I would have to use one of my most important treasures. Archon Silks now felt a bit of heartache at the prospect. I've only accumulated so many of them despite the passage of countless years. I was planning on using them in critical situations to defend against hegemons. Archon Silks now continued to hesitate as the two exchanged blows. Archon Silks now was vacillating, he really didn't want to use up his most important treasures. His more ordinary treasures such as common, hegemonic treasures might be precious to Dao Lords, but Archon Silks now had quite a few of them. However, those treasures generally only held 20 to 30% of the full power of a hegemon strike. It wasn't enough to kill an Archon of the Sacred Cities, nor was it enough to kill the current Ning. While Archon Silks now hesitated, he continued to hope that his furious barrage of attacks would be enough to kill Ning. If he could avoid using one of his life-saving treasures, he would do so, he wasn't going to use those things up casually. Riyayip. Far away, within the empty void that was beyond the area of 10 billion kilometers covered by the blurry light, a tear in spacetime suddenly appeared. This tear was enormous in size, and from it emerged the enormous head of an absolutely titanic beast. The eyes on this head looked like blazing stars, and they turned to stare at the distant field of combat, locking in on both Archon Silksnow and Dao Lord Dark North. Archon Silksnow sensed this new present, and he immediately turned to look. Archon Silksnow, stay your hand, the titanic beast said in a rumbling voice. He gem and bright shore. Archon Silksnow's face immediately turned pale. He gem and bright shore had actually charged over here in person, using his true body. Archon Silksnow had been hesitating, but a savage look immediately appeared on his face. He produced an ordinary-looking black hammer in his hands, then immediately tossed it out. The black warhammer transformed into an enormous streak of golden light which smashed straight towards the distant Ning. As it flew, the black warhammer's light began to increase dramatically as it became golden in color. The warhammer was dazzling to behold, and its aura alone caused Ning to feel the desire to prostrate himself before it. Ning forced down that thought, but he still felt a sense of shock in his heart. He hurriedly crushed two protective treasures, causing a barrier of water to appear around him as well as a strange river to cover him. Silks now. Hegemon Brightshore was enraged. His enormous body stretched out a single claw which tore straight through the blurry light. Boom! The barrier was completely ripped open. However, by the time he tore through it, the dazzling golden warhammer had already reached Ning. Boom! A terrifying wave of power smashed against Ning, blasting through the river around him and shattering the watery barrier. Although Ning strove to use his northbow swords to defend, the power of this strike vastly surpassed the strikes which Archon Silks now had unleashed previously. Ning's six arms were immediately torn apart, and his six northbow swords were sent flying as the terrifying power from the strike swept through Ning's entire body. The power was simply too great. I, am going to die. Ning only had enough time to turn his head to glance at the distant hegemon bright shore. As Ning stared at the titanic beast, his lips moved slightly. He wanted to say, 
save nine dust. Alas, Ning didn't have a chance to say a single word. His body was completely crushed into dust, leaving only a few magic treasures and his armor behind, floating in the void. No. Damn you. The blazing, star-like eyes of Hejem and Brightshore were filled with fury. He had already spoken, but Archon Silks now had actually chosen to kill Ning right in front of him. Riyayip. He had already torn straight through the blurry barrier of light. Now, the Hegemon's claw tore straight towards Archon Silks now. Archon Silks now had immediately transformed into a streak of light and flown towards Ning in the same instant that he used up one of his trump cards. He wanted to take away the treasures which Ning had left behind. He knew that Nine Dust and the Realmship parts were all within Ning's estate world treasure. And you actually think you are going to take the treasures as well? This enraged Hegem and Brightshore even further. His eyes emanated an aura of blurry light which caused space-time to congeal in the surrounding area. A wave of invisible pressure crushed down upon Archon Silks now, causing him to dramatically slow down. As for Hegem and Brightshore's claws, they tore straight through space itself as they reached out towards Archon Silks now. Previously, that aura of blurry light had condensed local space-time, but now that it had been destroyed, Hegem and Brightshore's attacks were able to almost instantly reach the target. So fast. The old man really lives up to his reputation as the premier Hegemon amongst the three Hegemons in our realm verse. Archon Silks now. Hurriedly used his saber arts to defend against that terrifying claw. Boom. The terrifying claw strike came, filled with such power that it was equal in might to the black warhammer treasure which Archon Silks now had just used. Archon Silks now was instantly shattered into tiny pieces of snow, but that snow quickly reassembled far away into Archon Silks now once more. When Autark Bolin was a hegemon, he had trained and mastered a total of ten hegemonic das. All that accumulated experience had allowed him to break through to become an Autark. Emperors possessed endless lifespans and thus would generally train in many das, hoping that these other das might stimulate and inspire them. Emperor Silks now himself was skilled in both the Tao of the Saber and the Tao of Snow. He had undergone the Tao merge via his Tao of the Saber and reached the Archon level of power. Over the course of countless years, he had slowly upgraded his Tao of Snow to that same level. Clearly, he wanted to use these two Daos to inspire him and slowly train to the Hegemon level via them. It was possible for emperors to train and cultivate, but improving was extremely difficult. Every single person who had been alive for that long, however, had life-preserving abilities available to them. The difference in power between Archons and Hegemons was quite apparent, and in a real head-on battle the Archon would definitely perish. However, some Archons had defensive techniques like invulnerable forms, while others were extremely skilled in other ways. For example, if one was extremely proficient in the Tao of Numerancy, one would be forewarned of danger and flee early on. Alternately, if one had an extremely formidable evasion art then one would be able to rely on it to escape and prevent even hegemons from catching up to them and killing them. Ning had already reached the Archon level, true, but he had merely trained in the Omega Sword Dao and didn't have an invulnerable form. In addition, he had only been training for a very brief period of time and had not accumulated enough treasures yet. There was simply no way for him to compete against the likes of Archon Silks now. The Elder Archons had accumulated many treasures of the years, some of which could have an impact on even actual hegemons. Hegemon Brightshore, are you really going to interfere over me killing Amir Dao Lord? Archon Silks now stood off in the distance. Although he was unhappy, he suppressed his anger. You and I have both lived in the endless territories for countless years. These Dao Lords come and go, there are nothing more than passerbys in our life. Dao Lord Dark North angered me, so I decided to kill him, this is a minor matter. You, an exalted Hegemon, actually decided to interfere? This is a bit much, isn't it? Hegemon Brightshore's voice boomed out sonorously from afar, Archon Silks now, this was indeed a minor matter, but since I spoke out, you should have been willing to discuss things peaceably. You actually dared to kill Dark North right in front of me. This little thief was lucky enough to steal an item I needed, Archon Silksnow said. Hegemon Brightshore, 
I don't want any of his other treasures, but I do want that little thief's estate world. If you are willing to give it to me, you can list any conditions you want. Humph, you killed Dark North in front of me, and you think you'll earn his treasures? Hegemon Brightshore said coldly, fudge off. If you don't, don't blame me for showing no mercy. You. Archon Silks now had an ugly look on his face. I said fudge off. Hegemon Brightshore's voice deepened even further. Fine. A Hegemon really is a Hegemon. I'll accede to your request this time. Archon Silks now ground his teeth, then turned and disappeared within a dimensional ripple. The reason why Archon Silks now had chosen to kill Ning at that critical moment was partially for the sake of the realm ship, but more importantly, he wanted to pull up grass by the roots. He understood that so long as Ning survived, Ning would quickly be able to master the twelfth stance of the Heart Sword art. By then, the difference in power between the two would be very small. There was already a feud between them. If Ning failed his Dao merge, it would be guaranteed that Ning would die. If he went crazy before dying, while Archon Silks now himself would be able to keep himself alive, the foundations of power he had spent countless eons establishing might be completely annihilated by the maddened Ning. If Ning succeeded in the Dao merge, things would be even worse. Thus, he had to kill Ning right away. Taking the treasure was just a secondary benefit. Alas, the Hegemon had stopped him. Hegemon Brightshore watched as Archon Silks now left, neither chasing or attacking. Killing Archon Silks now would be no easy feat. The Hegemon's titanic figure blurred, transforming into a humanoid figure. He returned to his normal form of a snowy-robed, white-bearded old man with six curved horns on his head. He waved his hand, collecting the North Bow swords, estate world, armor, and other treasures Ning had left behind. He murmured softly to himself, these treasures actually still have an owner? Dao Lord Dark North actually didn't die, can it be that he has a primal twin? Hegemon Brightshore revealed a smile. He felt rather apologetic towards Ning for not having been able to rescue him, but now he felt much better. He really does have a few tricks up his sleeve. Since he didn't die, his avatar should be at Vast Heaven Palace. I'll pay it a visit. Hegemon Brightshore took a single step forward, tearing through spacetime as he traveled towards Vast Heaven Palace. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.